Our scripture reading this morning is um, from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, um, 31 to 42. And it is, uh, it is at the tail end of the story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan uh, woman at the well. Meanwhile, Jesus' disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do, not, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for, white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and the other reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, he told, he told me all that, all that I ever did. So the Samaritans came to him, and they asked him to stay, stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you say that we, that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed the Savior, this is indeed the Savior of the world. <clears throat> we're starting a small group in Amherst, and we're only six. And it's, Pastor Paul shared with me about six years ago about starting a small, uh, starting a church plant in Amherst, so that's what it's, that's what we pray God will do with it. What God has done amongst us six is, is wonderful. I've asked God to show up because I, I told him, I said, God, this is for you, not for me. And if you don't show up, then I'm not carrying on. And God has showed up in some magnificent ways. This sermon is not about our church plan, but it's about what God is doing in this world. I invite you to, after the service and during the week, to go on to the convention website and just gaze at what's happening on um, October 27th um, in Moncton. It's called a uh, church planning summit. There's wonderful things happening. This has a lot to do with what was happening. This message has a lot to say about what was happening with John the Baptist, and not particularly what John the Baptist was doing, but what, what God had already planned and what he was doing with John the Baptist. There had to be a buzz in the town. I mean, that this man dressed in camel's hair and eating nothing like the people were, were in town and, and doing some wonderful things, in the wilderness, but things that had never been done before. I mean, certainly the water had been used for cleansing in the temple, but never were people baptized for the repentance of sins. And here John the Baptist was starting something new. He was asking people to refocus their lives and to enter into an intentional change of direction in their lives, that their lives would no longer be focused on their own will, but the will of the one who had sent them and created them in this world. Personal relationship with God was more essential than obeying the laws of the temple that had been laid, laid place. The laws of the, in, in the temple of the day had been laid in place and they became so uh, ritualized that there was no personal transformation. It was simply obey these laws and that's all you have to do. And this is not what Jesus had called even the Jews to live by. All this was in the time, politically, when the Roman domination of that era was, was made everything difficult. And as the, as the temple rules were being followed, it limited the personal growth. When you and I engage in a life that, that we, we set rules and regulations that we follow, and that's all we do, we can't grow past that. 
Jesus has not left us with a limitation of how close we can grow to God or, or even how much we can grow in our faith to strengthen ourselves and to use our gifts to do mighty acts. Mighty acts, even that of what Jesus had done in, in Samaria when he met the woman at the well. Little was seen in the temple of this day when John the Baptist was in the wilderness. Little was seen in the temple of personal change. It was all, just follow the rules, the leader said. Just follow the rules and we'll be good. As Jesus came on the scene, or was coming on the scene, he indicated the temple itself needed refocus. It was definitely a time of commotion and a time of, time of change. And as Pastor Paul and I have engaged in, uh, in much uh, learning on what God is doing with church planting and um, a C2C ministries that is, uh, that is coming out of, out of California, they have a charge from God to plant five million churches in this world. God is doing something new. They thought that number would be more like two, but as they gather together and they listen for God's voice, God is stretching them and saying, we need laborers for the harvest. And as we read in the scriptures today, the harvest fields are white for harvest. They are, they truly are, even in our day. So the commotion in the temple was, it was disturbing. I mean, the leaders had no idea. What do we do with this John the Baptist? What do we do with him? He is not, he is not following our rules. But yet, as we look back into the time when, when um, John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, was pregnant with him, and Mary pregnant with Jesus, when they stepped into a room together, they both heard, they both felt their wounds leap. There was something divine. God had called John the Baptist to change. He had called John the Baptist, though he was not, though he was not a divine conception, he had called John the Baptist to be the leader, as a song, as the writers in the Old Testament would say, that he comes to prepare the way for the Lord. And even though that was read in the read, written in the documents of the church, the, the temple leaders had somehow just overlooked it. And they were focused on their own agenda. The question I ask myself is, what state, what state is my faith? Where is my trust in Jesus? Is my trust in Jesus so vibrant that I, can, that, that I will allow Jesus to do whatever he wants with me? Will I allow Jesus to communicate those things that even I dare not, but yet he lays things on my lips, and will I communicate those things? Will I live my life with such a vibrancy as John the Baptist did in his day to change the world around him? To change the world. Jesus is real. Jesus is real. We've seen miracles. Even at Spring Hill Baptist Church in the men's room, we laid hands on a man who had cancer. And he went back for his pre-op surgery and they found nothing. That's in our day. That's in our day. Jesus is as live as, in, as, live, as alive today and vibrant and willing to heal his church and grow his church as he was in the day that John the Baptist walked in his camel hair, and, and ate those, those foods that you and I would just turn, up our, turn our lips up at. <clears throat> Maybe the fact and it's a in this message is, is that we need to refocus our lives. What is God doing in front of us? What, is God do what are we allowing God to do with us is my message for this morning. After John the Baptist had, had left this earth and he was, he, was, um, he was put to death, Jesus is confronted with the Pharisees about, about the disciples and their hand washing, and again about the rules. And the Pharisees are complaining about this rule that the, that the um, disciples have broken. They've broken this rule about hand washing and, and they never washed their hands before they ate some grain. And Jesus says this, This people honors me with their lips, but in, but in their heart, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, and teaching as doctrine the commandments of man. And I don't say that as a condemnation to you today. I say that to myself as well as I live my life. 
I wonder, as I live my life, am I creating rules and regulations that hold Jesus' power away from me, that don't allow me to free God to do with me as he chooses? Jesus then goes on to say that, that, it, is, that it is what comes out of a man that defiles a person. And that's found in um, Mark chapter 7, 14 to 23. Jesus validates, different from all what the temple leaders of the day, Jesus validates that everything and all food that will go into a man is clean. And they too had rules about unclean food. And this is what Jesus says. What comes out of a person is what defiles a person. For within... For within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, covet, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things, evil things, Jesus says, come from within and defile man. Apostle Paul says in his writings that we all have evil within inside of us. It is our nature. We are fallen people. And as we, as we look at this list and we wonder, like, are we like this? Am I like this? I ask myself, am I like this? Is there things in my life that, that cause a, a distance in my relationship with Jesus Christ that, doesn't, that I'm not empowering him to, to lead me into a deeper obedience to him? And this causes us to look at the world that we have to deal with today. And and I don't want to say deal with as in as in a world so far stretched that we shouldn't communicate with them, but a world that we need to minister to. A world that we need to befriend in the name of Jesus Christ. Sharing that living water that changed the life of the Samaritan woman and in that town where Jesus met her. It is a life of individualism. I heard one man say that it has taken billions of dollars of advertising to convince all of us that we need to live individual lives, that we all need that same tool, that we don't share with our neighbor because we need it all. We all need that. And as, I, as I've contemplated that very thought, there does seem to be some sense to that. A story, of a, a story of a man who shared tools with his neighbor and continued all his life. Meanwhile, the other neighbors around them, they were lived independent lives and they didn't collaborate together. And the one neighbor would come to him and say, to his shop and say, well, this is my shop too, isn't it? And he said, absolutely, he said. But when we look at ministering to our neighbors and and then we see all this advertising constantly in our face about, you know, we have tools in our shop that we use once a year and they sit for 12, 11 months. A study completed by Christian Smith in the book, a uh, book called Souls in Transition. This study was done in 2009 and it was done in the States. And it, and it shares how these, and it was the study done on the age between 18 and 29. And it shared how, how this age group, though they had been worshiping, and raised worshiping in the church, when they were asked the questions of what they aspired to, their aspirations were the American dream, total self-sufficiency, they did not need religion to interrupt their lives. Their plans to cohabitate uh, together before marriage and to ignore the what God is calling us to be. When they when they were asked what they look what they longed for, it was the weekends, you know, the partying, you know, whatever whatever would roll out underneath the carpet was fair game. This is a study that is being used and that book has been read throughout the world as an evangelistic tool as to how do we communicate again to this group of individuals who now 
18 to 29 then, who now is possibly 29 to 40. And then what happened to the 18 to 29s that are now? When we look around us and we see our pews empty, we know when we realize that we have a really secularized society and they don't know what happens on in here. They don't know that Jesus Christ is this living water that will change their lives and, and that this isn't another club, but that this is the living water. The church has become a religion another expression of what society might say is a clubhouse because they don't know what happens in here. And then we ask, who is it that needs to tell them? About our reading today, a quote from Matthew Henry's commentary, he says this, the Samaritans that both in blood and religion were more mongrel Jews, the posterity, posterity of those colonies which the king of Assyria planted thereafter the captivity of the ten tribes with whom the poor of the land that were left behind and many other Jews afterwards incorporated themselves. They worshiped God of Israel only and to whom they erected a temple on Mount Gerizim. Even in that society, here was, a, here was a segregation of a society and they set themselves aside and built their own temple and worship their own God. The road through the road through Samaria was not one that was that, that even Jesus asked his disciples to, to walk. He had encouraged his disciples in Matthew 10 to, to go take the message to the Jews first. Don't go to Samaritans. And here Jesus is caught, and, and some will say that Jesus is caught in a random act of just being there in the right time, walking through to Galilee, and he, had, he took the shortest route through Samaria, and a lady comes. A man's not supposed to talk to a woman in private or in, in public like that. A Jew's not supposed to talk to a Samaritan. And so maybe Jesus broke one of the biggest rules of the day. But yet when we look at the benefit of what he did communicate, heavens rejoicing greatly because so many were saved. As we look at our plans during the week and we look at the people that are before us, you know, I ask, I ask you and I ask me, you know, do I pray for those that I encounter daily that God might ask me to speak to them, to share with them, to bring them the living water, to have an unplanned ministry on Main Street in Parsboro, or for me in Amherst, to conversate about who Jesus is. You know, is he real? You know, sometimes we think it's, it's heretic to to voice the words of her mouth and ask somebody, is Jesus real? But to the culture that we communicate to, they have no idea. That some, of these, some of these generations now have never darkened the door of a church and know nothing of Jesus Christ. They may have heard the name. So when we ask, is Jesus real? We're not devaluing ourselves, but we're asking a question to them to engage in a conversation. An unplanned act of ministry. Jesus' day was plagued with cultures and personalities that were at war with each other, and they all lived in segregation. There were so many people who had not heard the message of Jesus or understood this message. The message of Jesus was presenting, for it was new and spiritually, transform, uh, spiritually transforming message. Those who should have understood this message were those who persecuted him. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders, all had the scriptures. There should have been no misunderstanding. The general population was completely unaware of the message, for many did not even know the scriptures. When Jesus began to open up this new message, many heard and received the message of hope. 
It was the religious leaders of the day, and can we call that the church of the day, who resisted the change that Jesus himself, the divine, the divine and the only one who can change lives, they resisted him. And Jesus himself was bringing his kingdom, his kingdom to this earth, and it is here today in the name of Jesus Christ, and it is his church. As it is today, this is the church of the Almighty God, the Almighty God, God of Israel, the great I Am. The faith was, was that of their own, and in, in the church, the faith, the faith was that of their own thought. They, had not, they would not share those things with Jesus Christ. Jesus presented a faith with accountability to, to that of God himself. Accountability is difficult. I remember what, finishing the late pastor program and Pastor Paul was my mentor and I, as I was uh, considering going into a recognized late pastor position, they said, well, we need to have another mentor for you. <laughs> but this is one that they would choose, not me. It's challenging. It's challenging to walk into a system of accountability, but I assure you folks, if you are not in a system of Christian accountability in a small group or otherwise, it is difficult to grow in your faith. I have been greatly rewarded as I take the steps with convention to, to walk into the pathway that I believe God's calling me, us as a family. But accountability is one of the greatest challenges because it questions your thoughts and how difficult that is at times for each one of us. In 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul encouraged the people not to compare themselves to themselves. It sounds simple, but it is so true. Even today, Christians compare their faith to their own faith rather than, the, rather than that to how far they can go in their faith when they measure and they, when they open themselves up to God. When we stop growing in our faith, when we stop sharing our faith, when our faith no longer has this excitement of this wonderful living water that is worth sharing, and then when we share within the church and we limit other people, you know, you can't go, you know, you can't go past that. You know, I've got it. Jesus, it is a day when Jesus today is, is again doing something new. Doing something new. There is a vibrancy out there. Reverend Karen Vincent, who heads up church planning within the convention, says that there's a vibration out there. There's, there's something out there, and God's doing it. We have to stay in this, we have to stay in this gap. And it's unknown. I mean, we lead, we lead, the, we lead, the, lead this group, and it's, you know, where's it going? Well, I know God's there. I can see him working. But where it's going, we do not know. Those are the most dangerous and challenging steps for you and me as Christian believers, but that is exactly where Jesus wants us. He wants us to trust solely and completely in him and to pour our faith and trust in Jesus Christ the maker, the empty cross, the empty tomb. He not only emptied the cross, but he emptied the tomb. He conquered death. It's living water, folks. And everybody needs to hear. I'm not asking you to rush out there and just preach over the streets. I'm asking you that Jesus is calling you into a relationship with non-Christians. Because it's living water. It's living water. It changes lives. And even, even within us, I'm sure Jesus has changes he wants to do. He's not done. He's not done with me. He's not done with you. Jesus tells another story in Mark 5 about the healing of a demon-possessed man. It is not the healing I want to talk about this morning. But the response, I've never studied this scripture in the light that I studied it and realized some of the things that actually happened. And for you and for me, it comes surprising. As 
Jesus sent the demons into the pigs and the pigs went roaring over the cliff and died. The herdsmen ran to, the, ran to town and told everybody. And everybody comes out and says, Jesus, you've got to leave. Wow. You've got to leave. Jesus is... Jesus' message of transformation and even in light of seeing this man who was demon possessed and now sitting calm and in his, in his right mind, his message was not received. There was fear of transformation. Fear of the unknown, of what lied ahead if they would ever bow down to Jesus Christ and allow him to rec uh, correct their lives. Do we say a total rejection of the gospel? The healed man insists on leaving with Jesus. And to me and you, and to this man, he says, you stay there, and you go into your town, and you share the gospel. That was new to me. When I looked at the ramifications of that, and when we read the scriptures and we hear Jesus saying that what they have done to you, to me, they will do to you. You will be rejected by the townspeople. You will be rejected by some. But he tells this man, and he insists, he never said it, but he insists, they have rejected me but go and tell those who will listen. To Nineveh, Jonah rejects the call to Nineveh. He finds himself in the belly of the whale. Only at that point does he, does he confess and say, Lord, come and save me. Spit up, on the, spit up on the ocean side. He goes to where God has called him. And people responded, God knows best. God knows best. We will be rejected. When we knock on doors and share and invite people to a small group, we will have doors slammed in our face. That's not our problem. That's not a personal slam. That's just Telling Jesus he just is not welcome here. But you go to the next door and you share again. Or you make another relationship and you share again. Because there is someone who's going to respond. You and I are challenged in a time when this world is in one of the greatest secularizations of all time. The world has never inhabited as many people as it has today. And we are, and I always share the message that my generation when I was, when I was young was the last generation that people were for, insisted by their parents to go to church. And I'm 53. There's a lot of generations after that that are lying out there and they do not know the living water. And even as we go down the street and walk out of here, some people may, may close the door to the church and those same people may just not understand really what happens here. They don't realize that Jesus is the living water. They don't know that Jesus is real. They don't know that the Holy Spirit, when they come and bow before the cross of Jesus Christ and repent their sins, they don't know that the Holy Spirit is going to come into their life in power and might, and, and all of a sudden they realize, that's what I was created for. That's what I'm called to do. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, folks, there is no recollection and there's no reminding in our lives the real reason what we have, are created for. Jesus says to his disciples, I have to leave. 
Because when I send my counselor, you can do more with me gone than when I am here with you. And to the dim.